but it grows in our DNA and then it is not funny anymore, right? When uh, we are full of excuses to where we actually start believing them. That we um, think that it's okay to tell that to the person that you're talking to, whether it's real or not. It's not a reason, it's an excuse. And I would like to share with you what I found um, the definition is of excuse. Okay, I mean, we all have them, we've all used them, we've all been guilty of it, but I think it's time to stop making them. Amen? See, to God there is no excuse for not fulfilling the call that he had uh, put on our lives. There isn't any excuse. When God calls us, we can say, as an excuse, I'm not ready, I'm not worthy, I can't do it, and so on, right? But none of those excuses matter to God. When he gives us a calling in our lives, he already has a plan for us to fulfill that calling. When we give an excuse, God gives a promise. You know, I heard by Pastor Mike Todd that, you know, where he guides, he provides. Okay? And he only funds what he has planned for you. So if you don't have it, that means it's really just your own plan. Because if he gave it to you, he will give you the means and the funds the strength and the grace to do it. Amen? So let's look at what an excuse, what it means. It is an attempt to release from an obligation or duty by mitigating circumstances. Mitigating, to lessen the blame attaching to a fault or offense or severity of the action. So by definition... An excuse sounds like something that belongs in a court of law. It's an apology used to gain exemption for service, a reason put forward to justify an offense. But it doesn't matter to God. When he calls you, he expects you to obey readily and willingly. And I think it is to our benefit to just do so, as we will see in some of the scriptures that I will read tonight. Amen. Benjamin Franklin said that he that is good at making excuses is seldom good for anything else. Amen. He who excuses himself accuses himself. An excuse cannot stand up. Excuses are just excuses. They're actually called guarded lies. Amen. We're very good at the art of making excuses, and um, these are some of the things that I have read and more. More excuses that you'll hear tonight. I didn't understand. I didn't know how. I didn't have the right tools. I didn't have enough money. I didn't have education. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. I'm too tall, I'm too short, I'm single, I'm divorced, I'm widowed. The more funny ones or lame ones, I threw my back out. I have a migraine. I have a relative coming from Wakanda, and I need to pick them up at the airport. That's my favorite. I have a doctor's appointment. I accidentally took an X-Lax and Prozac this morning. That's actually my second favorite. And in the Christian world, it sounds more like it's the pastor's job. It's not my calling. It's not my gift. I'm already wearing too many hats. Let someone else do it. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I don't feel good. Any of them sound fam familiar? We've all said them at one point or another. And whether it's true or not, you know, when God puts a demand on you, I think it is our responsibility to just say, 
Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Send me. I remember one Christmas play a few, not a few, actually several, several years ago. I um, was fairly new as a member here, and I was called to the side by um, one of the youth leaders before, and so I came over, and uh, he handed me a, a tape, and he said, okay, here, this is what I want you to do for the play. And I said, okay, what is it? He says, learn it. It's a song. And I'm thinking, if I wanted to get involved, I wanted to just be a prop person, like, you know, to put the, to be, to be putting props away. I didn't want to be a part of the play. And before I could say anything, he walked away. I'm like, oh, my God. So I go in my car. I listen to it. And, oh, my gosh, it's by Crystal Lewis. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she's got some soul and some vocals and notes that I've not, like, been able to reach. And I'm like, what are they thinking about? For me to be able, and it was going to be a three-day <laughs> performance. Do you all remember that? The ones who are still here? <laughs> yes, they remember that. That was probably one of the best plays ever done. And not because I sing, but, <laughs> but I realized, I realized that that was, I could look back to that and it was one of the scariest things that God has given me to do in front of people that I didn't say no to, although I wanted to so badly. But I said, okay, God, I'm doing this <laughs> unto you. I, 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 I have not done anything like this and in front of the church too at that and by myself to sing that you know solo but it worked out he gave me the strength the courage and the grace to do it because I didn't cop out I did not make any excuses because all I could think of was okay somebody is relying on me they gave the job to me and walked away did not even wait for a reply, okay? It was given and walked away. So I thought, okay, this is the start of something good and new in my life that I am not going to be able to say no to anything in this church. <laughs> and that's been pretty much it, amen? And I love every minute of it, every part of it. Is it easy? No. It's not always easy. Is it comfortable? No. It's not comfortable to be up here. Okay? It's not comfortable to be the scrutiny of every eyeball, you know, on a Wednesday night that are trying to roll because they're sleepy <laughs> to the back, right? And stomachs growling because they're actually thinking of the next meal like I was. But I say, God... If you've called me, you must have believed in me. You must have trusted that I can do it, and so I am trusting you. It's not about me, but it's about you. Amen? Jeremiah had every excuse ready when God called him to be a prophet. His excuses sound very much like our own today for not heeding God's voice when he calls. You know, I don't know why people are so reserved to talk about Jesus, right? I, I, I don't know what your story is. I don't know why you're not saved, if there's any one of you that's not saved. I don't know what your excuse may be. But tonight I pray that your ears and eyes will be open and your heart to receive the word and say, I can't have any more excuses because by the time you face the righteous judge, no excuse that you will ever come up will stand in his courtroom. You will be standing there alone, face to face with him. And I think it's best that we get a hold of our excuses now than later. Amen? Jeremiah was called to be a prophet to the nations. If you can turn your Bibles to Jeremiah 1, 5, and just stay there for a minute. 
not a priest like his father and grandfather. He was a prophet, chosen, and authorized spokesman for God. We often think of prophets, you know, who uh, prophesy, right, who tell the future. But a prophet like Jeremiah spoke messages to the present that had future ramifications. They were forth tellers rather than foretellers, okay? They were telling the message of God, exposing people's sins, and calling them back to their covenant responsibilities before God. So this is a serious calling that he obviously didn't really want to do. Being a prophet was more demanding than serving as a priest because the priest's duties were predictable. Everything was written down in the law. The prophet never knew from day to day what the Lord would call him to say or do. The priest worked primarily to preserve the past. The prophet worked to change the present so the nation would have a future. Priests dealt with externals, rituals, sacrifices, offerings, and services, while the prophets tried to reach and change hearts. Not a very popular thing to do. Priests ministered primarily to individuals with various needs. Prophets, on the other hand, addressed whole nations, and usually the people they addressed didn't want to hear the message. Priests belonged to a special tribe and therefore had authority and respect. But a prophet could come from any tribe and had to prove his divine call. Priests were supported from the sacrifices and offerings of the people, but prophets had no guaranteed income. John the Baptist and Jesus were prophets, right? Jesus traveled from place to place, challenging people to change so that their future in heaven would be secured and guaranteed. Jesus spoke to the hearts of people. Most did not accept his message, which cost him his life. John the Baptist spoke the truth and caused him his life. So you see, I'm sure that Moses, everybody knows Moses, right? would have had some excuses, and he did. I can name five of them that he did. And they probably would have been understandable to us mere people, right? Because, oh, yeah, I do, I understand. But not to God. Not to God. His excuses were, comba were combated with a promise. So, if we can understand and realize that his sufficiency is our sufficiency. His greatness is our greatness. Because it's not about, he knows what our weaknesses are, and we know what our weaknesses and our limitations are. But if he says, I will go with you, then that means that is the promise that he is going to go with you. You are not doing this alone, not on your own strength, not on your own might. Yes, you are being used as a vessel, as a conduit, as a representative, as a vessel to do what he has called you to do. There is nothing that we cannot do when we focus our eyes on him. So if we can, Jeremiah 1.5, See, God may assign you a demanding task, but his call keeps us going even when we're ready to quit. I chose you, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I set you apart before you were born. That's Jeremiah 1.5. That's what was God was telling Jeremiah when he was saying, um, but... I'm just a youth. I'm just a boy. I don't know what to say. And then God touched his mouth, and he said, you will say what I will say. You will go where I will tell you to go. What do you see? I mean, if you read the book of Jeremiah, it, it is a call that he was giving some excuses, but God says, but I am with you. 
I will go with you. Have we ever embarked on anything that we knew was difficult? It was a difficult, it was a dream that God put in our heart, right? What has stopped us from doing it? What is our greatest excuse? Some of us are just great procrastinators, right? And that is a dream killer, for sure. Because when God tells you, now is the time, that means now. When he says, you know, get ready, ready to roll up your sleeves, that means you are about to get to work. You are about to work. So you cannot be idle and lazy sitting on your comfortable couch or just sitting on your boat because you don't want to take a step of faith. Amen. It's, it's a heart issue. It's not even just the inability that we think we, we have our excuse on that. We are inadequate. We can't do it because we are not that talented. It's not that. It's the unwillingness the unwillingness to go because either we're afraid and because we don't trust God. If he already said, I will go with you, what more do you need, especially if he spoke to you and you heard him? I will go with you is probably the best thing that you can have as a promise that he is with you no matter what and where. Amen? So let's, <clears throat> let's turn our Bibles to um, Philippians 4.13. I think everybody can quote this by heart, right? And do we have the... Uh, um, the version that version, the uh, amplified. Words escape me. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Amen. If we meditate on this word, doesn't it, I don't know about you, but it, it does something to me. It makes me feel like I'm invincible, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's probably not just my ability to do something. It's the ability to endure, the ability to endure hardship, the ability to endure and to patiently wait whatever it is that I must wait for that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Is it a place to live, a job, a relationship, friendship, salvation of loved ones? That I can be there and watch it all happen, or even if not, that I have the faith to stand, and after having done all, that I can stand. Because in Christ, he is sufficient. Amen? He is our sufficiency. There is nothing that we cannot do in God. You know, when we're with God or when God is with us, the, poss the impossible becomes possible. And if God is with you, he, he, you become the majority, okay? Because he is the God of all creation. He is the supreme being who created you, who created me, who has given us the gifts, the talents, and the abilities to do all that he has called us to do. Amen? See, Moses had a supernatural encounter with God at the burning bush, okay? When we have a supernatural encounter with God, we don't need to make any more excuses. We don't need to worry about what other people may think or even think about us. If God called us, our response should be, yes, Lord, here I am. But that's not the case, is it? It's like those people invited to the banquet, right? 
Those people that were invited to the banquet had so many excuses, even though they knew that they should have been to that super banquet, that super party, that they've missed out because I got married, I bought a land, I bought some oxen, I have to tend to this and tend to that. They couldn't have picked other days, other times. Oh, it's Sunday, I'm going to do laundry, or I'm going to go to the car show, or I'm going to the game. Right? Excuses that prevent us from coming to the throne of grace or to fellowshipping and communing with the saints and hearing the message that is really for us, for our soul. It's, it's like deterring us from doing what we're supposed to be doing because something else came up better. What is coming up that you think is better than sitting at the feet of Jesus? What is your excuse for not serving God? What is your excuse for not rising up? What is your excuse for not answering to the call? What is your excuse for turning a deaf ear? What is your excuse for not being a good friend? What is your excuse for not being a good worker? A good manager? A good leader? What is your excuse for not believing? What is your excuse for not believing God? That you can't trust his word? That you can't wait when he says to wait? That you got to force the issue? Right? We all have done that. It's a heart issue. It's a faith issue. So we make those excuses thinking that, okay, they sound good. You're not fooling everybody. You may fool some of us some of the time. But you cannot fool us all the time. Excuses, again, are guarding guarded lies. They're hiding opportunities. You know, you hide. You hide from opportunities that are supposed to be yours because God, God told you, you're, you're the one that I called to do this. But you're hiding from the opportunity to serve. You're hiding from the opportunity to work. You're hiding from the opportunity to have a relationship with God and with others. See, Moses said, who, me? Yes, you. I'm a nobody, he said. This is a pitiful excuse. But it is often our first argument. Okay, okay. We say and think, look at all my past mistakes. What can you possibly want with me, right? I'm sure Moses was dwelling in the past because he's now about 80 years old, okay? He was, you know, 40 years spent in the wilderness now. He said he tried this deliverer thing back in Egypt and it didn't work, right? Way back when. That was because he did it in his own might and strength. No one listened to him back then, so why should they listen to him now? Some of us may have been deeply wounded and are still hurting from what happened to us in the past. Do you know what I say to that? Get over it. Let it go and get over it. Allow God to heal you. Allow God to mend your broken heart. Allow God to free you. Allow God to liberate you from those haunting thoughts of the past. Allow him to revive you, to rejuvenate you, to re-energize you. Allow him to sustain you now. There's nothing good back there. That's another sermon, but there is no excuse to stay back there. But Moses was looking to the past because of his mistakes. He says, I'm a nobody, God. But God says, don't worry. What did he say again? I'm with you. I will go with you. It's not the little you that's going to confront Pharaoh. I'm just using you, but it's me, the big God, my friend. I am the one who's going to speak through you. Hallelujah. And God says, I've got this. I just want you to do it. I've chosen you. What's happening with Moses is that he's saying, God, I really don't trust you. Okay? It's, again, it's a faith issue. The sin of excuses will 
confront us in the judgment day. But standing before God, again, you will have no more excuses. So I think it is better off for us to just let them run their course now. Just stay away from making excuses. You know, don't make any excuse. Don't make any excuses. Excuse yourself from making excuses. Stop offering an excuse to your excuses. Amen? Don't offer any more excuses on top of an excuse. Just stop. It doesn't even sound good. It doesn't even sound real. Just stop making excuses. You know, you don't want to go, don't go. Let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Try over, I mean, stop over explaining yourself. Because it doesn't do you any justice. Amen? It doesn't. It just make you look worse. <laughs> Sound worse. Amen? Our excuses when it comes to God are often a matter of the heart. When he calls us to serve him, we tell him there's nowhere to do it or that we're waiting for the right time. When he calls us to get connected with other believers, we tell him of our difficulties in our relationship as if he doesn't know. That is why he wants you to get involved so that you learn to serve others and prefer others before you prefer yourself so that you can, be, you can learn how to be a friend, right? So you can, you can learn how to fellowship, so you can be selfless instead of being selfish. When he calls us to tell others about Jesus, we lean on the church and say, oh, they'll take care of that, right? They'll take care of that. When they come to uh, church on Sunday, they'll hear about Jesus. Well, what about from you? Hasn't Jesus done anything in your life? I mean, I know that we are supposed to be a living testimony, right? But sometimes there are opportunities, but we get afraid, especially when you're talking to someone really smart that you think they're really smart and educated, right? That, you know, we think, oh, they're not going to listen to me because they're, you know, like I work with doctors and and you know, doctors <laughs> and some people in management. And uh, it can be intimidating and they're intimidating and sometimes they can cuss and swear like sailors. But, you know, it's those little opportunities that can make the difference. It's like, you know, when you, you're not like a billboard talking nonstop about Jesus, yet your character is stinky, I'm talking about when you have those real opportunities that are led by the Holy Spirit, that you open up your mouth and something, sometimes something happens. And God tells us, Jesus said he commanded us to go. Even if no one would hear or listen to you, sometimes you just have to open up your mouth and speak. Speak the word, speak the truth. Look at Billy Graham. Oh my gosh. I, I, I watched many of the multi, you know, many clips, and he's just, you know, amazing with what he has done. It's like, I think his message was just about the love of God. He spoke of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He told the truth, non-condemning, but it's about the Messiah who came to save us. It's about his love, which led a lot of people to salvation, Amen. It's that call, that call that it's his goodness and loving kindness that lead people to repentance. So what is our excuse when we are so blessed with fat bellies? I'm talking about really full, right? And he adds no sorrow to it. What is our excuse for not being able to make an impact at least on one person? One person. That's because we're either lazy, right? We have excuses that, oh, no, no one's going to listen to me or no one's going to hear me or no, I don't have time for that. We have to dig deep on these series of excuses. You know what? We have to look to the cross 
look to Jesus, look to love. That is when you can break down those barriers and say, God, I have no more excuses. I really can't come up with any more excuses as to why I'm not giving my all to you when you've given up your best for me. Amen? I mean, you sent your son. He left his glory from heaven to walk on earth so that I can be reconciled with you. I mean, that is just that unfathomable, right? Unfailing and unending perfect love that doesn't stop here. You know that we think, oh, I'm, I'm going to enjoy heaven when I die. No, we can enjoy heaven here now in Christ alone. Yes, it's all in your perspective. Why do I need to wait till I get to heaven? This is why he's given us Jesus so we can live our lives here on earth full. He says so that you might live and live more abundantly. It's not about having all these material things and toys and riches and fame. It's not about that. It's about having a relationship with the one true king who can talk back to you. Amen. Who hears your prayers and answers them. Amen. So for those who have been turned off, I mean, I don't know, probably not here yet, but I don't see any unfamiliar faces, I don't think. But if you've been turned off by Christianity, don't. Don't even look to us. Right? Don't. Look to Jesus. Amen. Because we're all sinners. We're all, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Judge Christianity by the head of the church, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen? Don't judge Christianity by mere men. You know, look again to the cross, to Jesus, to love. Amen? You see, if you think about it, why would God choose an 80-year-old Hebrew exile to lead the Israelites out of captivity? An 80-year-old man. Why would he choose Moses, right? Because God, as the Bible says, chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You know, it's to show forth his power, his grace, his strength, his glory to the world. That it's not the man doing it, but God in the man and through the man, amen? Why would God choose Peter, an impetuous, hot-tempered man who didn't even really understand his faith to build the rock the first church upon him why would he choose paul a persecutor a murderer of the christians of the believers back then and why would he choose the teenage boy david to slay goliath right when there was a whole army of he's got brothers and other israelites that were soldiers that were bigger than David, who could have done the job. But why did God choose these men? Because he had planned. He had planned it a long time ago, predestined, purposed, and planned. And guess what? Um, even if they had excuses, they finally said yes. Yes, I didn't hear David putting up a fight. I didn't hear Paul putting up a fight right? He didn't know. He thought he was on the right side of the very best. He thought he was doing it all right. He was, he was it and a bag of chips. Paul thought he was that. But when he encountered Jesus, when he encountered the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, it completely changed his life. It turned him around. Amen. And I did not see any wiggling back. Right? He didn't say, oh, I was better off when I was serving the world. That my life was better when I didn't know Jesus. Before I came to El Shaddai, my life was just very exciting and good. And now it's boring. I'm here on a Wednesday night listening to Sister Rowena. You know, it's like, 
Seriously, people think that some people, maybe not anyone here, think that their lives were better before meeting Jesus? I beg to differ. I beg to differ because my mind has been open and so I can't, I can't go back and say, no, nope, my um, life was actually way better before I met Christ. No, it's because my mind has been opened up, my heart has been opened up, my life has been exposed to his goodness, to his grace, to his mercy, that I cannot deny that unfailing love that I'm actually able to give it back, that I'm actually filled with his grace, that I actually got what I didn't deserve, that's grace and mercy. What would be my excuse to say that my life was way better than before? I have none. To serve God is the ultimate thing. Like my worship to him is my life. What he has given me is the gift of life. What I become of me is my gift back to him. So what is our excuse for not doing our very best? Or what is our excuse for kicking doors open that God shut? Right? Or we're trying to shut the doors that God is opening. Oh, I don't want to go through that door, God. Oh, no. Not that person. Or not that job. Oh, no. You know, it's like we know better than him. I think the church needs to wake up and say, you know, I need to step up my game. I need to get involved. I need to participate and not just be a spectator because God is pouring out his spirit to those who are waiting, ready, and willing. And he says, I am here. Whoever hears my voice now, I will sup with him. I will eat with him. That's sup, right? I will eat with him. And that means a close communion, a close fellowship with that person. Are you inviting Jesus to your, to your, to your house? Or is he just a perpetual guest? You know, to where he's not allowed in certain areas. You know, like how guests are, right? Right? He's not really a part of your house because, or your home because um, he's not welcome in the third bedroom chamber there, you know? What is the excuse? What are you hiding, right? Or is he a constant, like, is he the center of your life, of your home, of your marriage, of your everything? What is keeping you apart from him? In Hosea, he said, come back to me. All of you who are afraid, don't let fear keep you apart from me. Amen. Don't let anything anything fearful or shameful or even guilt to keep you away from God. Because after all, that's why he died for you and me, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He made us to be righteous in Christ alone. Amen. So I think it, it would, it would really benefit us if we know why we're making so many excuses for saying, not yet, Lord, later, I'm too busy, I'm too this, I'm too that. You know, for those of you who have been here for a length uh, of time, a length period of time, I think it would be safe for me to say that those of us who might have, who have, not might have, remained even after people have gone, you know, they have their reasons or what have you, For those people who have remained and remained steadfast, I think that's what we need to look at and not worry about why they left, who left, where do they go. Because if um, truth be told, if you find out, what would you do? What will you do? 
Will you be able to do something about it? The best way to do is pray, right? And to continue to extend that hand of grace, that mercy, you know, and if they should want it, it's there. If not, you don't need to chase after them. You don't need to feel like you have to explain. They may have their reasons or they may have their excuses. They will have to face God. They will have to answer to God. They will have to say, Lord, I did not because, and he will say, I don't care about your excuses. I don't care. I put you there to learn from the word, from their experiences, from the teaching, from the message or the messages. It's not about what you want. It's not about your comfort. It's not about, it's not about how you feel. God doesn't really care about how you feel per se, okay? Because these people have given him excuses and he came back with the word. He came back with his promise. He came back with, I am with you. Trust me. This is what I want you to do. He did not really, he, there was no debate. There was no, you know, if you want to follow Jesus, there is no interview. He just said, hey, if you want to follow me, come and pick up your cross. Deny yourself daily. There was no interview like, what's in it for me, right? They didn't get to ask that. They were men from all different walks of life, fishermen, tax collectors, a physician. I mean, they're different people, but God called them and they saw. They were attracted to the anointing and they saw what miracles he's done. They saw and understood and learned. And that's what we ought to learn from. That's what we ought to see, that we are disciples of God in Christ Jesus. If we want to be discipled, if we want to be taught, if we want to be students of the word, amen? But we cannot be lazy. We cannot not read our word. We cannot not spend time with God and fellowship with him because we're fellowshipping too much with others. Okay, yet we don't want to pay the price and stay up late or get up early so that we can fellowship with the Father. I think it should be neutralized. If you party hard, you should pray harder. Amen? I don't party hard. I don't even party. I party here. Amen? And I know how to get down here. Yeah, don't get me started. I might grab the mic. But it's funner, I believe. So I don't think that it was better for me before I got saved. You know, Some people think that Christianity is like the funeral. Far from it. Not here. Not the way that I've gotten saved. This is not a funeral. This is like a party. A a forever, ever ready going. You know, where, you know, it's like, I think even the food that I've eaten is better. It's like, (laughs) including, I'm talking about the word of God and the actual meals. Amen. Amen. And the friends that I have you know, friendships that I have forged, people that are around me. I mean, not perfect, right? Not perfect. But, you know, God's love perfects us daily. He wants us to strive for excellence, to be closer to him. And the closer we get to him, the more that we will be and look more like Jesus. Amen. So we have no excuse. We have no excuse not to spend more time with the Father in Jesus. Amen.